Welcome to the Productive AI Podcast, where we aim to simplify AI and make it more accessible to business leaders. I'm your host, Troy Angrenon. If you're an AI product company and you're looking to raise funding to accelerate your growth, you're going to be interested in the conversation that I'm having today with Kevin Tu from Draper Fisher Jurvetson Growth, or DFJ Growth. If you stick around to the end, Kevin and I will be talking about advice that he has for entrepreneurs who are building AI products and AI product companies. If you don't know, Draper Fisher Jurvetson is one of the old guard in the venture capital industry, and DFJ Growth is a subsidiary of that. Uh, and this goes way back to 1959, uh, the original Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Draper Gaither Anderson, and then that eventually became Draper Fisher Jurvetson with Tim Draper, John Fisher, and Steve Jurvetson. And they backed some pretty big names in their day, Baidu, Hotmail, Skype, and many, many others. And then after the dot-com bust, they formed DFJ Growth. And that was really focused on helping tech companies scale by staying private longer. And in doing that, they actually created an entire new venture category called Venture Growth. Uh, since then, this group has invested in things like Coinbase, SpaceX, Tesla, Twitter, Unity, Neuralink, Ring, Data Robot, and so many others. Uh, so with that, I'm going to do a quick introduction of Kevin. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us on the show today and really excited to have this conversation. Of course. Great to be here. I've enjoyed all of our previous conversations. So why not make a podcast out of it? Right, Troy? Excellent. Yeah, that was kind of, I think that was a favorite quote of mine from one of the podcast folks that I followed and he said, I was having these so many great conversations. I wanted to share them with the world. So yeah, I agree very much. I think we, if we have this, hopefully more people will learn about AI and get interested in the space and figure out what to do with it. So I wanted to start with just kind of your background. You've got a really interesting background um, going all the way from kind of the engineering world to the venture world. And when I looked back at some of the sort of the history of your career, you were a developer in 3D stuff. You got involved in startup incubators in Cambridge. You worked on the Kindle. You worked on Google Glass way before when it was just kind of kicking off, as well as things like Android platform and Pebble Watch platform before smartwatches really took off. So you were really hardcore kind of into, into the engineering space. And then you seem to take this in like serious right turn into venture finance and investment banking and things like that. So I'd love to hear that story. How did you sort of start in engineering and end up as a venture capital uh, associate? Of course, uh, great, to, uh, uh, great place to start. I think that my story begins growing up in the Silicon Valley, which was a huge benefit, right? Being surrounded by technology, both my parents were engineers by training. And so growing up, um, my dad was involved in startups. And so at home, I was tinkering with little products he brought home from work. And that was just what I was born and raised on. And so I, had the, um, I was lucky enough to go off to MIT where I studied computer science. And there it was just such a rich and fertile ground to be exploring and getting my hands dirty with all things uh, engineering, all things building. I was one of those kids who found himself always working on some project uh, during the summers, on the side, during the semesters, and really embodied the couple college kids in a dorm or fraternity building out, building out a product. Um, that said, I did get involved in the accelerator and incubator scene out in the Boston area, as you mentioned, and that was actually where I first met some VCs. And to me, what I was really shocked by was how wise they were. And I was some wide-eyed, you know, 18-year-old kid. These people knew so much about both business and technology, and that was a really unique combination. And I only had one of those sides. Because at MIT, you're taking all these classes, whether it's algorithms or compilers, and uh, all these fun, very deep engineering um, courses, but I realized I lacked that sort of business knowledge. And so that was kind of what sparked my interest to want to go and pursue and learn more about uh, th this business side of things. So I uh, spent some time transitioning into then the world of finance, um, investing, venture, and growth. And that's ultimately what led me uh, through, through various experiences to DFJ Growth, where I now spend my time investing full time. And so that's a little bit about the story. And I think the, the biggest takeaway there is the fact that a lot of these different startups I worked at, you listed a few, uh, some of the platforms and technologies I've been a part of, you know, a lot of those didn't pan out, um, a handful of the startups that, that I was at. And that really goes to show that it's not just about building great product and having a great engineering talent. You really need to think about the business side of things. And that is important to build uh, to building something successful and, and creating a good outcome. So that was some of the learnings and kind of how I got to where I am today. 
I've had this conversation with a few folks who've followed your same path. It sort of started in the hardcore engineering world and moved into business. And I think I, I came similarly in the sense that I was very interested in technology and then also kind of came to the same conclusion as you, which is you sort of need, bo need both sides uh, in order to be successful. So that's really, really a cool story about how you got here. Now you're working on a whole bunch of different, you're looking at a lot of different portfolio companies, obviously investing in a few of those. Um, and you and I specifically, we're gonna talk about kind of how to take that and translate into the AI space, AI product company space. So I think the best place to start is, I would love to hear your take as somebody who is immersed in the field on where are we in the big picture. So at the 10, you know, 100,000 foot view, the 10 year view, let's say, where are we in terms of the arc of AI in its current phase? And of course, we've talked about this on prior episodes. Uh, you know, we're 60 years into this, so it's going to be a long game. Uh, but let's just say the next 10 years where we kind of have, have a bead on like what's coming next without getting into the, you know, the areas of general intelligence and things like that. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Kaifu Lee, he talks about his kind of four waves, right? The internet AI, which is we're well underway, right? With Amazon and things like that. And then gets into business AI, perceptive AI, and then kind of autonomous AI. Um, I don't know if you use that model or if, if you and your, your uh, you know, peers in your firm use a different model. Uh, but if you could talk about where you think we are and where we're going, that would be great. Of course. And I think, as you mentioned, you know, AI itself is a 50, 60 year old technology. And there have been many inflection points, right, during AI's long history. Uh, and so there have been winters and springs, each fueled by a new breakthrough in research. However, I do feel, and I'm not the only person to say this, that this AI spring, summer, whatever you call it, looks and feels a little bit different. I do think that progress with AI is really starting to snowball. And we see its work itself working its way out of just research and academia and into real world applications. And now that the ROI is real, dollars will continue to flow here, creating this feedback loop for further investment in the space. And so I think that being still in the early days, we're on this inflection journey where the next decade will be very exciting. There will continue to be really uh, new advancements, things that um, we never thought AI would be able to do, at least on this time time horizon. We're going to see that, and we're going to see a huge penetration of AI into our existing business and, and everyday lives. And so that is already happening. I think we see it in the venture world. We see it in the startup world. And I think that it's going to really just accelerate over the next decade. And Peeling that back, I think the why now for me is that there are actually a convergence of a couple of factors. So first is that on the software side, there have been advancements in deep learning over the past three to five years and neural nets. And this has really improved algorithm efficiency and accuracy. And so you look at, for example, GPT-3 and all the excitement it started up over the summer about all these different use cases that it had. If you think about the core technology, the transformers, that's a relatively new breakthrough that you know people are still researching and developing on. And so you look at that, and that was only a three to five year window. And we now have this output that's only going to get better with GPT-4, 5, et cetera. So that's the software. And then on the infrastructure side, I think we're also seeing some really interesting things go on. So we're seeing faster and cheaper compute storage, networking, and what that it does is it really unlocks the value of all the increasing amounts of data around us, right? So it's not just that we now have accessibility of cloud computing and things are cheaper and coming down the cost curve, but when you think about actually running AI and training it or running it on the edge and IoT devices and things that aren't just in your data center and you have these powerful servers or GPUs running this, I think infrastructure is actually enabling AI to have that penetration. And so that's one of the key things. And I think the last thing I just mentioned up front is that we're still in this era of digital transformation. Companies are creating these new masses of data to put to work and software is just improving at an exponential rate. And so the combination of all these things really creates this perfect breeding ground for the why now of AI, which makes me really believe that the next decade ahead is only going to pick up steam and it's going to uh, continue this, this really rapid pace that we are on of innovation and excitement. And when you and I talked about this before, when we were kind of setting up like ideas we had for the discussion, one of the things we talked about was kind of what, what are you seeing in the, in the world sort of now in terms of portfolio companies coming to you in this kind of AI enabled versus AI first. So it'd be interesting to unpack that. 
And then kind of related to that, you had said there's kind of what you think you're going to see or what you are seeing now, what you think we're going to see soon in terms of companies that will get formed. And then what probably is going to take a few years, maybe four or five years, just because we have to put some building blocks in place. Could you talk about that? Of course. And so in terms of what we're seeing in the VC world, and generally I sense we're in a period where many companies are AI enabled as you said, and eventually we'll transition to a period where most companies are AI first. And breaking that down, I think what I mean by AI enabled is that what we're seeing is companies trying to layer AI onto existing SaaS, security, business workflows to enhance existing functionality. And this is driving meaningful value. But in my mind, it is a bit incremental when you're looking at, hey, we could save 10% here, 20% there. It could have a huge dollar amount, but in some ways it's incremental to the core existing workflows that businesses already have. The transition will be when companies are then becoming AI first. And that's opening up new capabilities that weren't previously possible and ultimately changing how people do business. And this is where it will cause orders of magnitude change. And I could confidently say we're actually seeing the first wave of AI first companies in the early stages getting off the ground. So businesses that have fully architected around having an AI business model, cost structure, and using that software to completely change what the business looks like. And so we are on this kind of evolution of AI enabled to AI first. And that does kind of translate into what we're seeing in terms of the real world use cases and the areas that are getting the most traction. So we are definitely seeing innovation across basically every category you can imagine, whether it's consumer, social, fintech, security, you name it. And uh, you know, I think the easiest way to look at it is breaking it into buckets of what's happening now, what's happening in the near term, and what's happening in the longer term. So. In general, what's happening now is that it is the solutions that are most narrowly focused and have distinct AI applications, those are growing the fastest. And it is this concept of AI enabled. And the thing to emphasize is that it's okay to start narrow. It's actually a byproduct of where the technology is today. When you look at reinforcement learning and what AI can do by just feeding it masses of data and being trained on that specific data, supervised learning, right? And so you have these line of business enterprise apps um, and you're bringing AI to a specific workflow or one piece of that consumer interaction. Um, it's the easiest to adopt by customers as well because it brings these efficiency benefits, but it doesn't fully disrupt their operations. And so you'd see things in sales and marketing like companies like Outreach and Gong, you see a lot in support and IT where it's just reducing touch points. It's, it's improving time to resolution. And those are things that no, no company is going to complain about, right? So that's kind of where we are today. And I think in the near term, one of the things that we're excited about is there are actually entire industries that are evolving and moving and just a little bit slower to adopt. And they still need to go through digital transformation before they can even take advantage of AI. So when you think about abstract systems problems across manufacturing, oil and gas, or healthcare, Many of these are very bespoke and require years of either domain expertise or consultants or services to make this AI really work. And so in these categories, AI is coming, but definitely around the corner. And I think in this near term, you're also going to see these initial AI first applications really take hold and companies built uh, from the ground up around AI. And I think the last piece to just mention is, as you mentioned, the long term view. Right, there are so many exciting things that are just on the horizon that AI is definitely going to have a hold on. So when you think about brain computer interfaces, uh, we have a portfolio company, Neuralink, founded by Elon Musk, they're, they're innovating there. You think about computational bio, bio, drug discovery, all of these things are going to make major waves and AI is here and it's working and people developing with it, but due to structural industry dynamics or regulatory dynamics, it will take a little bit longer to realize some of the value here um, compared to just perhaps traditional enterprise SaaS where the AI can get going and off the ground today. So there's a lot said there, but hopefully that gives a sense of kind of what we're seeing um, and, and the timeline for some of these different use cases across AI applications. That was perfect. Uh, and that was exactly what I was hoping to go through. Um, we wanted to, I wanted to look at two companies that you have already funded uh, and uh, help me on the pronunciation. I think it's Neosis, right? The uh, Correct. dental robot company. And then Data Robot, which sounds like a robot company, but is actually a machine learning platform software company. 
And so if you could just talk about kind of, you know, how do they fit into the portfolio? How do they fit into your bigger picture? What kinds of problems are, are they working on? And why were they interesting enough for you guys to fund? Yes, yes. And maybe just briefly mentioning a bit about DFJ growth and how we invest. You know, we're really looking for post product market fit companies that are scaling rapidly and have large, exciting market opportunities. And many of the companies we backed, whether it's Form Labs, SpaceX, Tesla, they're, they're creating their own market opportunities as well. So with all of that, I think autonomy, autonomous systems and AI is actually a core theme that we've been investing in for a while now. And so talking about each of these, and we could get into what the companies do, but um, Neosis, they're bringing surgical robotics to the field of dentistry, which is something that you know, really lacked innovation relative to other parts of, of the healthcare field. And so what, you know, robotic applications can do, whether it's uh, assisted guidance or visualization, um, there are a lot of ways that human assisted surgery can be much, much more efficient. It could be more accurate. It could be faster. And it can actually enable and empower dentists to do things that they weren't able to do. And so there are a whole host of benefits that Neosis can drive for people trying to do uh, dental implants or full arch replacements that were previously very manual, done, you know, line of sight. And now you have a robot uh, that is assisting you and, and enabling you to do it uh, and ultimately provide better care to your patients. So we're very excited about what they're doing. And we announced that investment um, earlier this fall. And so briefly talking about Data Robot, which is a very different company, but incredibly exciting for its own right, is, uh, you know, just the vision of bringing automated modeling and how do you really enable businesses to um, both deploy and, and take advantage of data science and machine learning. So what they've really done, the core technology was allowing you to run automated models on your data to figure out and understand what is the what are the best set of parameters and how is it optimized so that you can run and, and run predictions, right? And what they really cracked the code on was the fact that they are able to really make this uh, accessible to people who aren't necessarily just hardcore AI practitioners and data scientists. If you think about the world and where we are, there's an exponential increase in the amount of data and there's so much um, need for people who really have these skills. But the, the growth of uh, data scientists, machine learning practitioners, it's, it's slower. And there's just this gap in terms of you know, how, how many people are needed. And so the vision there is to really enable everyone from these hardcore data scientists to business analysts to be able to take advantage of AI more. And so while they started with kind of the, the building, tuning, and deploying of models, they've now kind of expanded both directions to really own more of the machine learning and data science workflows so that you can have one place to really um, uh, handle it start to finish and also drive ROI. And uh, we could get into that more, but I think that what they've done a really good job at is being able to show big enterprises, look, you can use this software, you can use this modeling to drive meaningful bottom line value. Uh, and and that is really impactful and why they're selling and, and why people are using them. So hopefully that gives a high level take on both Neosis and Data Robot and, and how they're using AI in different ways to, to change the world we live in. Were there particular things about both of those that attracted DFJ growth the most? Just kind of key, maybe com common overlapping things, or maybe they were two different things, but where your team just looked at them and said, look, we've looked at hundreds and hundreds of companies, but you have something special. Yeah, it's uh, every company is different. And I think our investment memos be right. I think really try and capture that view on what why we get excited. I think with Neosis, one of the things I really shown is we talk to a lot of customers, we talk to people using the product and their glowing reviews on how impactful it was to how they did business, the number of customers they could serve, the quality of care. It, it was really clear to us that they were the leaders in this very exciting new market that no one else was really innovating in. And so when we're able to get those signs of early market leadership with a truly disruptive solution over the status quo, that's where we get excited. So we definitely saw that there. I think with Data Robot, it's somewhat of a different story. I think that you know, what they were able to do is really go into C-suite uh, kind of boardroom conversations and convince people, here are different workflows that you can roll out. Here are the ways that our predictions can generate millions of dollars of value, whether top line increase, bottom line savings. And that sort of 
that sort of um, ability to capture and quantify the value and uh, led to really large contracts with really impressive logos. And I think that was the sort of momentum that we were seeing that we felt, you know, we built the conviction that this is a tool that can have a really broad reach and really make AI accessible. And given where we are in the adoption cycle, that's exactly what we need. We need tools that are allowing people to actually make use of this AI and bring it out of the laboratories and uh, sorry, out of like research labs and into the real world practical business applications. Right, because product moving things out of the lab into the real world is hard, number one, and then get, finding and or articulating the ROI on that is often hard. And there's a, a, almost an interim step of just working through all the experiments and actually even succeeding at the experiments. And then hopefully you succeed at those and then you can prove the ROI. So there's, there's a lot of gap. There are a lot of gaps in the space right now in terms of being able to communicate that stuff. So if they were able to do that with their customers, that's huge. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and this kind of ties me to the next thing. And there were really a few things that are, are kind of related here that you and I talked about. Principles of companies that you think will succeed in this space. Uh, and if you want to talk about that separately or together with kind of this idea of, you know, how do you think about the stack? Maybe those are two separate conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's tackle them separately. But just to begin on principles of companies that we think will succeed. I think as VCs, it's uh, sometimes difficult to, you know, meet all these different companies and try and figure out, you know, they're all tackling the same problem with slightly different angles. And it's kind of our job to make sense of, of that noise and form of view on the world. And I think that trying to make a really general piece of advice for companies is that for AI focused companies, it's really important to start small and be very focused and really nail a key problem first. I think you, you know, we often have these companies and it's important to have this broad vision and expansion opportunity for where you want to take the product. But in the beginning, I think it's really uh, you know, important to be focused. And, and one of the ways to do that is really think about what is the problem you're solving and focusing on categories that deliver the most ROI. Because what we're seeing as we talk to enterprise buyers and vendors is that budgets and dollars are inherently drawn to those applications, the ones that all have the biggest dollars associated with it. And that's why, you know, you see a lot of dollars flowing to security, to uh, sales and marketing, to logistics, because there are just huge amounts of dollars that uh, enterprise budgets have in those areas. So in Ensuring that you're addressing a big and real pain point with sufficient TAM and urgency is, I think, one of the principles that we really look for in companies that we think are going to be successful. And then I think the other thing is, you know, we talk to a lot of very technical founders as well. It's also important to be focused on the business elements from pretty early on. So thinking about selling and go to market and creating a sustainable value proposition, uh, all of that matters and it's important to build a great technical product, but you need those because that will fuel your future reinvestment into new AI applications, into hiring right, the right talent and expanding into new use cases. So summarizing some of that, it's important to, I think, start small, deliver that value as soon as possible. And that's kind of what a lot of VCs are looking for. And then you want to then uh, see, okay, what is the longer term vision? Let's say this is successful, where can it go from here? So I think that's kind of a baseline of how to think about things. Okay, and then, so now let's talk about, you know, where these companies are coming to you in the stack. And the stack can be defined in many different ways. I've seen all sorts of crazy market maps. I've built many crazy market maps over the years. Uh, and so I'm curious to know how you think about the space and where these various companies are coming into and building these building blocks that we need in order to get to the next three and five and 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think what we do, and we've done similar landscaping work, we put logos on pages, I think we kind of break the layers of the stack into three main layers. And so starting from the bottom up, I think that you really need to think about the hardware and semiconductors as part of uh, as, as, as the foundation, right? Hardware is definitely part of the why now we spoke about that. And I think that there are a lot of actually enabling infrastructure innovations that have come to market and are coming to market that are going to accelerate this AI adoption. So it's everything from data storage and networking to in-place analytics to real-time databases and all the tooling to en 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 enable that on the hardware level. Um, that's all important. And then you also have this whole host of AI chip companies, whether it's Graphcore, Cerebras, Mythic, 
Sentient, Grok, there's a whole long list of people innovating both at the edge and in the data centers, whether training, whether inference. Um, there are a lot of different ways that this is being tackled, but the end result will hopefully be AI that enables you to roll out these, the, these AI and ML applications wherever you want and in a very efficient way. So that's kind of the core that, you know, it's, it's a very investable layer of the stack. You get some of the uh, dynamics that you're going to have when you're investing in hardware and semiconductors that us as investors need to be uh, thoughtful of. But this is kind of one of the key components that everything else is based on. The second layer of the stack is what I think of as the frameworks, tools, and enabling technologies. And so what you can think of here is, is kind of the engines or open source tools for natural language processing, for computer vision. And this is really actually democratizing AI for enterprises, developers. And it's a really important piece of the stack because this is, a, a, you know, as the industry is still standardizing workflows, there isn't really a right way to do AI yet. Um, people are toying with all these different tools and people are really pushing forward. You know, this is the best way to, you know, use these frameworks and use these tools. And um, I think that, as more people continue to innovate here, it's, it, it will emerge a clear way of this is how you best do AI. Um, and there's a lot of innovation here, a lot of startups really trying to build out tools, whether it's on the labeling side, whether it's on the data pipeline side, to really just get, get your start to finish workflows uh, in place. And so on a personal level, I've always had the question about how the public cloud providers will compete here as they're actually all coming out with their own offerings, but there is a clear opportunity here for startups. And I think that if you look as an analogy to um, a, a different category uh, in DevOps, which is also still very much in the early days, but what they're doing for the software development lifecycle, I think that there will be analogies to what's happening in AI and machine learning ops, right? We need the tools, processes, and end-to-end -end workflows to empower developers to deploy AI at enterprise scale. And so there's a, this is a very ripe area for, for innovation. And I think the last uh, kind of category of the stack that I would talk about is vertical applications. And my belief is that significant value will be captured by those who actually have access to the customers and the data. And AI is, for now, when we talk about AI-enabled companies and narrow use cases, it's best implemented where companies can really leverage thousands of examples to drive ROI. And you know, with that, companies are going to be able to build moats from unique access to that data. And this lends itself to the rise of best-in-breed vertical AI applications. So that said, whether it's in autonomous vehicles or cybersecurity or supply chain or sales and marketing, you know, we're investing across all of these different areas and we're seeing AI uh, really being trained on, on their customers in the field. And what they're doing is building up a really unique understanding of that specific vertical and how to best cater, uh, how to optimize uh, things that are going on. So. To, to summarize some of that, I think at DFJ Growth, we're definitely investing in companies all up and down all the verticals of, uh, of the stack. And there's opportunity across all of them. And you know, I think the biggest thing is to just be cognizant around the different business models and challenges you face at each of these different parts of the stack. And that kind of leads me to my next question around business models, and this is something you and I discussed. Now, one of the other you know major venture capital firms in the space had published a very public, uh, yeah, it was just a blog post, and they made, I think, a bit of a splash when they said, AI product companies should expect not to receive the same valuations as regular product companies because they're they're actually more like services companies you know this and this gets to the bigger issue of just business models in general are they different or are they the same is this a new era or is this just more of the same of what we've always done you can just run the same playbooks that we've always built in product companies do you have any thoughts on that yeah i do and i think you know time will tell how things um pan out especially when you look at the valuation front well there right. well you might have lower margin businesses uh on the other hand, you'll have some of the hype and flash around the AI surrounding the specific company that may counteract that, right? Right. Um, so I think on the business model side, uh, as I mentioned, it's really important for AI companies to think about the business model and solve for it from the early days, right? AI is sometimes known to be very services heavy with a lot of customization. And there are companies that right. we've met that deal with that. And that's 
partly because of where AI is as an industry and the involvement it might take to really get it going and up and running and trained and integrated into all the legacy tools, into all the, all the systems and processes that you need in this, whatever vertical you're tackling. And I think it's really important to note that in the early days, it's okay to do things that aren't fully scalable. You have to build the platform somehow and get your flagship customers and jumpstart your AI product and data flywheels. But you do have to be hyper-conscious around the cost structure and the margins and how much you're spending on those efforts. And so I wouldn't say that you know, it's a completely different way of thinking about the world because traditional enterprise SaaS companies still have to face that same question around how much services and, and, and support they're going to provide. And I think you know, a properly designed product at the end of the day will hopefully minimize the amount of services and support required over time. And um, so there's that side of things. But the other side is that AI is not a cheap technology to run. And you've seen this you know, in companies that aren't AI companies, but perhaps storage companies or analytics companies, right? The sheer compute alone for the manipulation or storage of data, full, uh, data is really meaningful. And so we've seen AI companies that have a ton of S3 or AWS spend, but that's kind of expected. And as VCs, I do think uh, that we're able to look past a lot of that and recognize that as companies scale, their costs will be amortized over a larger customer base. And you know, we've seen that story across our portfolio of the companies being able to work those margins up. And so you know, between the two of those, I think it is really more important to be more cautious about the services and customization required and to always remember and think about the business model um, as, you continue, uh, as you continue scaling. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you're still building a business and selling a service and, uh, you know, you, the amount that you can charge will be based on how valuable that product is and how much value you do, you're delivering to the customer. So um, I, I, I think that business model aside, uh, I do think that AI companies are going to be able to create and, uh, very valuable businesses and sustainable business, uh, business models that generate cash flow in the long term. That's great. I'm always a little cautious when I hear this is a new era. It's all different because uh, I think I've heard probably you and I have both heard that too many times and uh, mm -hmm. it never turns out to be true. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And it always kind of comes back to base principles. And I lived that you know, pretty deeply in the cloud computing world where ultimately we would go back to these companies and say, actually, what you're doing is not different. It's the same thing. We're just changing how we're doing it, but we're doing the mm. same things. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, a lot of that applies here. Uh, and you touched on it. We'll just kind of wrap up or not wrap up, but kind of close out on this point. Um, you kind of touched on this issue that a lot of these startups are coming to you and they have huge infrastructure costs, right? They're starting on the cloud as most startups do and have for, for many years. So they're building a bunch of stuff. And of course they have data gravity and they have cost structure there. You had an interesting idea that when we talked before that sort of at a certain point, they cross a threshold. What are your thoughts there? That where they, where they have to start really thinking about that? At what point do they need to worry about that, I guess, is the question. Yeah, yeah. And I think it comes down to this concept of finding product market fit. And we hone in on this a lot at DFJ Growth because that's kind of sure. the threshold that we think about for, hey, is this have they validated the technology? And is there a go-to-market that kind of supports this business? And you know, with that, I think that once you have a handful of customers where you have a sense for what their needs are, and once you believe that you can kind of repeat and scale that in a future customer, that's where I think you really need to start honing in and jumping from like, okay, it's about getting this one customer successful to okay, how do we do this in a scalable fashion? And that's when you start really right. thinking about the costs and how much you've been spending to support that customer, how long it takes to integrate that product into their existing systems. And all of those dynamics, I think once you hit that handful of customers and you think you have a sense for, okay, they're up and running and we know why they're paying us. And um, at that point, that is the crossover where it's really important to begin thinking about, okay, how can we do this um, at scale and have the proper economics to not um, not just run out of money uh, by plowing it into every other customer that you have to solve for. 
Yeah, and I've, I've had that conversation with a few folks. So up, up front, it's really about using cloud just because that's the most flexible option. And then ultimately, once you tip over past product market fit and you start thinking about scaling the business, at that point, you're gonna have to start thinking about cost optimization. And that may or may not drive different technical choices or replatforms mm -hmm. or something at that point. Yeah, and, and I think the way to think about that is almost this concept of, you know, you're always going to have technical debt. There are always things you can do on the cost optimization front. And it's important to just think about when is the right time to make that the priority. And in the early days where you're really just solving product market fit, uh, I think that that should be secondary. But over time, it will become a much more primary focus as you really think about building a sustainable business. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think that kind of brings us to the conclusion for the main part of the conversation of what I have today. So I really appreciate all of your time and, you know, conversations up front. One of the things I kind of committed at the beginning of this call is that we would talk that I would ask you kind of your thoughts on advice to builders. And really, this is, a, I guess, a two part, but we'll keep it focused on on AI. It's sort of just general advice that you maybe think is applicable to everybody. I think we can do that very quickly and probably enough of those podcasts have been held. Uh, and then, you know, you can sort of just summarize that. And then really, I think the interesting part is, and then what's new and different in this AI space. So do you have any AI specific guidance? Because a lot of the folks listening to this uh, or that I'm talking to, they're all building AI product companies. And I think that they would find that very valuable. What's new and different above and beyond the traditional VC advice that they always hear given to entrepreneurs? Of course, of course. And so I'll hit on that, that one first about what's the general one. And I think that it's key to really remember it's the dollars from the customers are what counts. Getting from zero to one is really hard. And so as we were talking, it's okay to sometimes not be fully scalable, but do whatever you can to find that product market fit rapidly. And so finding and fixing real pains is how you do that. You know, look for those high ROI projects that will get you know, funding and get your flywheel spinning quickly. And I think as we turn to AI itself and like what's different and what the advice would be for AI companies, I think I have a couple. And the first is to really don't be distracted by all of the shiny, hot, new technical advancements. There will continue to be a lot of really exciting things changing and evolving in AI, GPT-3 being a perfect example. The key is, though, to focus on AI that works and really getting it into the hands of the customer rather than constantly chasing the next new AI thing. After speaking with a lot of people who are deep in this space and entrepreneurs who have both built and sold AI companies, their advice is that it wasn't always that their models or had these really unique advancements or were cutting edge. Um, they did have really good technology, but the application and how they did it was really key to why they were able to drive value. And so there are obviously exceptions. There are companies that the tech really matters the most, and that's the core. But for many, it's about solving a real problem and that that will be more helpful than just using the most cutting edge AI every time. And I think the second piece of advice for AI builders is that it's important to remember that AI is already leaps and bounds ahead of whatever your customers have today. And so you might not be or have the top AI expert from MIT or Stanford on your team, but you can still uh, provide a lot of magic to the consumer. The opportunity here is massive and then on the order of trillions of dollars. It's so, it's so large, it's hard to put a number to it. But I think that really just shows that you just need to be focused on building great technology and solving a good problem. And you can provide real magic for the customer, no matter kind of what your background is. And there's so much opportunity for AI to drive value. So hopefully that helps to all the builders out there experimenting in AI. I'm sure it will. That was great. I appreciated that. So let's end on this note. What um, for folks who are listening, they're building an AI product company, or they're they're either leading that team, or they're on that team, and they want to start reaching out to talk to you know potential funders and start raising funds. Um, first off, at what stage are are you interested in hearing from these folks? What yeah. So we the ecosystem. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and uh, the the venture markets and growth markets seem to grow more and more every year. Right. Um, I'll say that where we sit, uh, as I mentioned, at DFJ Growth, we're focused on post-product market fit investing when companies are ready for hyper growth. And so often that might look like a series B or beyond. Uh, we could scale up and invest in much later stage companies, but we aren't generally doing the seed series A you know, investing. 
Um, that said, I often do meet with entrepreneurs and, and get to know them early because that's how you build the relationships. You get to know what's going on in the ecosystem. So uh, it really doesn't matter kind of what stage you're at, but if you have a product that's starting to work and you're really starting to think about scaling, that's where you know I'd love to chat. Um, and um, you know, I think the other thing is I really enjoy talking to practitioners as I feel that's really informative and helpful. So whether you're a VP of engineering, head of ML or data, um, I found really symbiotic conversations from just talking to people about the tools we're using, the things we're looking at, how we're seeing things evolve. Because um, we talk to a lot of customers and, and product people and, and you know, uh, are able to share how we see the world uh, evolving as well. So there are a lot of ways to collaborate. And I think one of the fun things about the AI space is that, you know, everyone's looking to learn. There's humility um, and people are trying to go on this journey together and, and figure out how to build the best technology and really usher in this new wave of AI. So hopefully as a call to action, there are a lot of ways I'm, I'm pretty accessible online. So I uh, would love to chat if you're working on interesting things in this category. Yeah, and we'll put those links in the show notes, but maybe just for the purpose of the recording, what is the best way to reach you? Awesome. Uh, you could find me on LinkedIn. Um, at my Twitter, my handle is KevBTU. Uh, my email is just ktu at dfj.com. Uh, we're all pretty open. It's all on our website as well. So feel free to drop a line and look forward to you know connecting with others in the AI community. That's great. I appreciate that. All right. Well, Kevin, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, in fact, we had to do this a couple of times. So I super appreciate your patience and your grace uh, with all the technical challenges. And just for the conversation we've had over the last couple of months, it's been really great since we first, uh, first met. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on the show. Of course. It was a blast. And I look forward to all the future conversations to come. All right. Absolutely. Have a good one, Troy. Yep. So that brings us to the end of today's Productive AI podcast. And that was Kevin Tu from DFJ Growth. I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. Please check out the show notes for the links for everything that we've discussed today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I hope to see you on the next episode.